very, very welcome to the, the last and present series. And all I can say is the six months have flown and that uh, we have really enjoyed the series so far. And I don't think tonight will be any exception. Um, so I'm sure you're all familiar with Des. He's an annual visitor to our series. So uh, Des is going to speak to us tonight on the various tours that pass through Tipperary and the comments, complimentary and otherwise, that they may have had on our county. So um, Des, I'm going to wish you welcome you and everybody we have. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask, could you put your phones in silence if you don't mind, please? Um, 
then there's the chap whose name I, I very much use, this German chap, um, a so-called prince, but you have to remember princes at that time in Germany were kind of, you know, threepence for three dozen. Anyway, he was Hermann Ludwig Heinrich von Puchler Muscat. And um, point again, I'll, I'll touch on, he um, has interesting things to say about Cashel, which most of these visitors do, because the thing that brought most of them to the county um, was to see the Rock of Cashel, um, which can have its drawback, because some of them then give you tedious accounts of um, um, the archaeology, I know Richard is here, but I mean, they are tedious accounts of kind of what would pass at that time for archaeology and with lots of kind of, weird kind of theories. Um, when you come then to the famine, um, which is obviously a very short period, about a half dozen accounts, which again surprised me, I think it would be so many. The one that matters most for here is the one published in 1852, Alexander Somerville, the Bristler at the Plough, which was republished around the time of the commemoration of the famine, using a different name, I forget what name it was used, so it is available. Asaph Nicholson did two books, but didn't come here for the famine one, but she did come to Tipperary for the one she wrote just before the famine. And then for the remainder of the 19th century, um, not as many as you might think. I, I, I did expect most would come to that period, only about 20. And then for the 20th century, again, around 20 sources that I could locate. Again, some of those are famous. I mean, people know that H.P. Morton, people familiar with William Goldfin, um, both of those have quite a lot to say about the county. Um, breaking it down then in terms of where some of these people came from, of the roughly 105 that I could locate, a uh, small number were American, the end of the 19th century, and a small number were women. Fewer women than I would have expected because uh, at a time when you know, it was restricted, a lot of areas of life were restricted for women, but some of the ones that had the money and inclination could travel, and of course a lot of women wrote, so I, I, I did think maybe some more. Before we kind of start to do a kind of a survey, which is how it's organized, and I have two people here. Nancy is from Tipperary. He's more, Nancy is more used to being behind the scenes in terms of dramatic productions, and uh, I decided rather than you listening to me reading some of the extracts that might be more fun to listen to other people. Carl O'Donoghue has a practice here in Paris. He's from Tip, um, is used to appearing kind of on stage, so he has most of the readings because we said most of the people who are on are, are me. We'll, we'll come to those in a few minutes. And um, when I was picking extracts, um, interested in illustrating the kind of material, but also in entertaining, because some of the extracts are, are entertaining. Um, before I get on to the extracts, which I'm going to do chronologically, um, just a few kind of key questions, looking at this type of material and how it might be used. Um, so just six questions worth looking at. First of all, where did these people come from and why did they come? Um, and if they came to Tipperary, kind of what determined their itinerary within Tipperary? Um, who they were, there's no one answer to that. I mean, some of them were, were writing books to make money. Um, some of them were exercising kind of intellectual curiosity. Um, some of them had access to grind, political access, particularly from the 19th century. Some of them, like um, the American lady Nicholson, was a do-gooder, um, which doesn't take from her, but that's basically why she was here to save the Irish people from themselves. So there's no, absolutely, if there's a hundred writers, there's a hundred motivations. Um, why they came to Tipperary, because obviously lots of them came to Ireland and didn't come near Tipperary. And as I mentioned already, uh, kind of two reasons. One is the rock, but the other is in terms of where they were before they came to Tipperary. And there were kind of three routes. If they were in Waterford, that kind of pulled them in towards Clonmel. If they were in Cork, Mitchellstown, into Clahine and Clare. <clears throat> if they were in Limerick, it's rather surprising me how many of them ended up in Tipperary town which wouldn't have struck me as the most obvious place you'd want to see if you came to the county, but again, it was a place you might pass through on your way to Cashel if you were coming from Limerick. So that kind of explains why there are so few north of the county. And as I said, it isn't even a 75 or 25 split, very few. Um, I mean, if you look at it in terms of towns, the number of, of these kind of counts that I could come across would say for, for Ross Gray, virtually nothing. Um, very few for Nina but as I said, the towns in the south of the county. Um, for anybody who's going to use this material, people doing parish histories or local histories or whatever, um, sometimes they, they're inclined to just take this material at face value um, and use it, which is, is, is problematic because you have to 
look at the context. Um, one of the writers that I particularly like is this, this chap called George Holmes, and he, he does write about North Tipperary. He's one of the few that, that uh, touches on the North. And this is just a, a brief extract from his writing about Nina and coming towards Nina. And I just want to make a point when I finished the extract. Here we rested to enjoy the fruits of our labour and dwell upon the beauteous landscape. In the vague beneath us were seated the house and extensive parks of Kilboy. On the right, the brow of a hill, rough and broken with scattered rock and bushy underwood, formed an admirable foreground. In the distance appeared the town of Nina, rising from a bosom of trees, partially illumined by the sunbeams, which sported along the plain in scattered patches, now gilding one object, then shifting to another. Beyond the town, the Shannon appeared like liquid silver, and on it goes. Well, the crucial thing about that, of course, is that it's 1797, and it's pure Wordsworth. So, I mean, if you don't kind of understand that that's where he's coming from when he comes to Ireland, he wants this kind of romantic landscape. And whatever he looks at is going to be imbued by what it is he wants to find in Ireland. So there isn't much point in using this material and just taking it at face value and divorcing it from its context. Um, these travellers give two kinds of information. Um, one is obvious, um, you know, that they're, the information about where they're visiting and what they're describing. And even if we don't agree, with their descriptions, their, their interest. Um, but also, of course, we learn about the concerns, the preoccupations, the agendas, the hang-ups, the mindset of the visitors. And um, you're not going to understand the material unless you take that into account. As I said, the chap I just read, um, George Holmes, if you don't get the point, but he's very much into that whole nature thing, you're going to rather miss the point. Um, one of the reasons, of course, that brought him here is, again, if you look at the date, a lot of these people would have gone to the continent for, for a period of time before and after 1800, the continent wasn't somewhere they could go, so they were kind of stuck with Ireland. Um, one of the few women who came, Anne Plumtree, um, the quotation from her, which I very much like because she, she makes two points about this kind of writing. Um, in narrating the results of my investigations, I have looked to fidelity as my polar star. Okay, that's fair enough, I'm going to be honest about what I see. But at the same time, I had been very ambitious that truth be dressed in an amusing garb. So that's the other thing. And there's always a tension between those two desires. To be truthful and honest about what you see, and to try and understand it as best you can, but at the same time to be entertaining. And sometimes those two don't, don't quite gel. And another general point is looking at the visitors come late 18th, early 19th century, um, particularly when they come to Tipperary. There's this tremendous feeling that they're being wonderfully transgressive. Um, today, I suppose the equivalent would be somebody deciding they wanted to take their holidays in Somalia. I mean, you know, it wouldn't be top of anybody's list, and it would suggest that you would be wanted to touch of danger. Um, a, a chap called John Walker, um, in his memoir, I mean, talked about the celebrity of Tipperary for its massacres and murders, riotous fairs, and faction fights, which is exactly what would have brought some of the people into the county, so they could write about it. Um, my favourite was the Scottish Reverend James Hall. He was here in 1807, and um, the detail from his attitude, he's talking about approaching Tipperary, which he called the Wilds of Ireland, and so this is his technique for coping, his coping strategy. I began to look out for my crossbars of steel, a thing that can be carried in the pocket and which, costing four or five shillings only, may be screwed on the inside of a room door, so as to prevent any person from coming to rob or disturb one in the night. So clearly, that was an essential item to have in your luggage. One of the things that I like about his book is you talk about people putting everything into the title. I mean, if you're writing a book, you have to give some thought to the title. Um, his book has a wonderful title. Um, Tour through Ireland, okay, fair enough. Particularly the interior and least known parts. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Containing an accurate view of the party's politics and improvements in the different provinces with reflections and observations on the Union of Britain and Ireland, the practicability and advantages of a telegraphic communication between the two countries, and other matters of importance. <laughs> I couldn't resist such a wonderful old title. <laughs> and two more points, kind of general points about this material. I mean, some of the, the, the visitors of this passion for, I suppose, antiquarianism, and it doesn't matter kind of, even if they're in the county and you know stuff is in, it's happening that's interesting politically, they're not going to pay any attention to it. Um, that can be somewhat tedious. There's a 17, um, 
was a lady, a French lady, Madame de Beauvais, who was here in 1891, and this was prompted, this is her comment on a visit to Cash, and I really, I like this. She's warning, obviously, <coughs> French people who might be thinking of coming to Ireland. A thing of which the traveller in Ireland soon gets as weary of as looking at ruined abbeys is hearing about Cromwell. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then the last general point, which is wonderful about these sources, and I kind of called it Who Knew? And I just picked out six kind of Who Knew from some of this material. Who knew that in 1686, that the Dutch manager of the textile industry established in Carrick and Shore lived in a house shipped from Holland and re erected in Carrick and Shore? Who knew that Lady Donamore, on the one hand, never locked her front door? but at the same time never went to bed without making sure her husband's pistols were loaded. <laughs> Who knew that a mother could feed an infant on discarded or spat out gooseberry skins? Not so funny. Who knew that Ross Gray was a dark, dilapidated town with a horrible pavement, all round stones and mud? Who knew that in Borisali, the top floors of the half cabins, half shops that lined the suburbs were full of couples doing the jig. Which <laughs> may or may not be. Uh, <laughs> and then the last one, who knew, this is one I found very strange, this is 1920s. Who knew that in the 1920s, if you were going on the train between Limerick and Tiberian Town, that on every single train there was a ballad singer who was the daughter of a station master and she was given special permission to sing her ballads on that train to earn a living? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So just going back to the various periods. So before the 18th century, um, the first one that kind of touches, that would meet the criteria of being a kind of personal, as seen from official or government report. So William Brereton's account of Travels in Ireland, 1635, and there's a book that was written recently in the Minute series, C.J. Woods, some of you, if you're interested in this material, would be aware of it. It's a guide to some of this material. He, he described that as the earliest Irish tour, um, so that's 1635. And what he means simply is that in that the personality of the writer comes across, which isn't the case if it's some kind of a government report. Um, he was an experienced writer, and um, basically what you, you get a sense of, which is true of modern writers, that you know, while I'm, while I'm writing, while I'm having this experience, I'm already thinking about how I'm going to write about it. And of course there is a change between the experience and the writing. Um, I mentioned when I was just giving a, a brief account of how many writers there are for various periods. Um, the one that I particularly like um, is the one in Thurlis, Roland Davies, um, who was here in 1690. Um, he was a member of the Church of Ireland. He was, at 30, he was Dean of Ross, so obviously got promotion quite early. 1689, panic, he and his family fled to England. The following year he came back as chaplain to one of King William's regiments, and his account wonderfully conveys what is true in any army at any time. No one seems to know what the hell is going on. And, that's, and it's quite a comprehensive account, it's not just a little, a little reference. There's a lot of waiting about and foraging for supplies. On the 29th of July, 1690, he was at Cashel, and he dined with Miss Penfeller. He then got permission from Ginkel, one of William's Dutch generals, to go with an armed party to secure Thurles, disarm the Irish, and procure provisions. And so, the first reading, which Carl is going to do, we start at the close of his journal entry on the 29th of July, 1690. And uh, in, in the, the, the uh, entry, he refers to his brother Matthew, which of course is George Matthew, who's Lady Thurlis's, because he was related to George Matthew through marriage, even though Matthew was Catholic and he was on the, on the Protestant side, and it didn't really matter. So, um, this is Roland Davies and Thurlis. And again, it's interesting to think that the bridge he's talking about is the same, you know, Okay, about eleven at night, we left the camp with about thirty horse and ten dragoons, under the command of Captain Saunder, a Dutchman that spoke Latin but very little English. The night proved very dark, so that we lost our way and were forced to halt a while until the air grew lighter, a little beyond Cashel. The, ter the thirteenth. We came to Thurlis very early in the morning and immediately took care to secure all my brother Matthews' things, 
Then we employed ourselves to get bread and salt for the army, and I sent two loaves of bread to Major General Scrabenmore and one to Ginkle's aide de camp. We also bought six barrels of wheat at 20 shillings per barrel, employed the mills to grind, and the baker to make it into loaves. Also, we secured three bushels of salt at 15 shillings per bushel, and sent Scraven Moore an account of our proceedings. I wrote the letter, and Captain Saunders signed it. Here I found my mare and two coats with her, which I endeavoured to secure, and took up my quarter at Mr. Persons, with the Governor and Captain Aldworth. We ordered the <coughs> papists of the town also to deliver up all their arms instantly, otherwise to be plundered by the dragoons, which accordingly many did, whose names we enrolled, and gave them certificates for their protection. And at night my brother and I, as well as the captain, took our lodging in the castle, 31st of July. We employed all the hands we could get in making bread, and gave certificates to those that brought in their arms. We, all, we dined all at Cornet Matthews and spent the day in the aforesaid business. Well, that's just um, an extract. Um, if you're wondering where you can get hold of this material, of course, a lot of this material is um, downloadable from Google Books if you do a little bit of routing. So you absolutely, I mean, nothing is easier to get hold of than a lot of this material because obviously it's, it's out of copyright, so there's no difficulty. Um, anyway, I can tell you about that later if you want to. So, that's so that particular one is, is available in Google Books. Um, when you come to the 18th century, um, one of the first visitors to Tipperary was John Loveday. Again, wonderful name. He was 20 years old. Um, his it, it, it material is interesting because he was one of these people who was um, had money, educated, doing a tour, um, motivated by curiosity. He had no hang-ups about Ireland being an appalling place, and he was just interested in the different habits that he was going to find in Ireland. Um, very much kind of almost like an anthropologist. Um, he travelled on horseback. Um, he has a wonderful account, which um, Carl is going to read, um, of being stuck in Golden. Um, the weather detained him. Again, he was on his way to Cashel, obviously. Um, he had passed by Thomastown, which again was something that brought people towards that part of the county. And so, what do you do to entertain yourself if you're stuck in Golden on a wet Tuesday evening? Well, <laughs> this is what he does. <laughs> in the afternoon at Golden, where the weather detained us, we heard a strange yell, and looking out there was a coffin, a white sheet spread over us, attended by a good number of people to a malt house opposite to our inn. At about seven o'clock, I went into the place. Everything was preparing for the solemnity. At one end of the room was a table spread with a white cloth, on it candles lighted, and sprigs of rosemary, some stuck in candlesticks, etc., with a plate of halfpence. On one side stood a stool, on which a bowl of tobacco and pipes. On the other side, the table was the coffin on the ground, the lid off, the body covered. Round about sat men and women, etc. This they call a wake, or waking a corpse. The poorer Catholics always do thus, in their own cabins if large enough. This of the deceased not being so commodious, they borrowed my landlady's empty vault house. They smoke and howl interchangeably all night, sitting by the corpse. In the morning, I'm told the priest comes and performs some ceremonies, and then they carry the dead to its grave, the priest attending to the churchyard gate. Everyone that comes to the wake, except very poor, pays his half penny. The expense of the candles and tobacco is defrayed with this. I paid my penny for intruding and was offered a pipe of tobacco. One woman softly groaned out, a home, a home, a home. Thanks, Governor. Um, I'm sure things have changed in Golden Well a lot, and they still have those. But a decade after, the thing that's interesting about Lovelace's account, as I say, I mean, it's, it's very honest compared to some of the accounts we'll see later, but very much come with, with an agenda. Um, a decade after um, Love Day was here, there was William Chetwood, a London bookseller, and um, Chapel Road for the theatre. Interesting, his motivation in coming to Ireland was to get away from his creditors and then wrote about it to try and make a few bars, I suppose, to, to pay them off. Um, what, what amused me about him is he, he, his comment on the roads at the time, and he particularly was on the road from Feathers to Cashel. 
and he was talking about it was, it was quite good. And any of you ever been on the road? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just struck me the contrast. I mean, not everything doesn't necessarily improve. <laughs> the other thing that in his account I, I thought was very funny, um, he was in, in, a, in a carriage. Um, some people would have travelled in a horseback, but he was in a carriage. And the person that he was travelling with was injured, so they needed to get help and shelter. And so they went to a nearby inn. And it just so happened that the innkeeper's father was a tenant of his uncle back in Shropshire. So it just I mean, just another illustration of how small a world it actually is. And I love the, the, the way he commented on that. It is some satisfaction to meet with a person we know, let his station be ever so much below us, more especially in another kingdom when we least expected us. And poor old Cheshwood. I mean, again, when you read some of these accounts, you're taken by the personalities that come across in some instances, in other instances not. But I mean, he, he was quite interesting. He died in his late 20s. Um, and it's, it's, as I said, it's, it just it seems to have an appealing personality. Um, no account of the writers who came here in the 18th century. Um, you couldn't possibly give a, a description without talking about Richard Twist. Now, Twist wasn't here very much kind of touched on the county, but he was the one that got up everybody's nose and was uniformly anti-Irish. Um, and the thing that people, it's kind of known about him is that um, enterprising manufacturers uh, made a chamber pot. It's fairly well known, but they're kind of, if you find one in the attic, it's a collector's item, and put his face at the bottom. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and there are different, there's a kind of more polite and less polite kind of verses that go with it, the kind of one that's more... Uh, the thing is, of course, his name twists, wonderfully rhymed with. <laughs> he would be the golden liar, well deserving of hellfire. Everyone who likes me piss upon the learned Dr. Twist. <laughs> now, that, that's the kind of more, the more... The one I prefer is the much posher version, which is very much like um, some of the 18th century Augustine poets. Now, again, I'll just read this, but watch you to bear in mind that what's being described is a chamber pot. It doesn't sound as if that's what's being described, but it is. Okay, without a foliage crowns the polished frames and burnished gold and flowers of purple flames. Within, the potter plants thy Richard's face and bids him stare in horrible grimace. Through lakes of amber, as the face appears, thy face repentance seems bedewed with tears. <laughs> Now, Twist had little enough to say about Tipperary, but he, he did touch on Cashel. <coughs> and I, I love the fact that um, he, he came to see the ruins in Cashel and was disappointed with how ruined they were. <laughs> and then about Cashel itself, it was dismissed as small, wretched, and dirty. And that was Tipperary dismissed. So you can see why he very much kind of got up in his nose. As far as, uh, with regard to the 18th century writers, the one that is the most famous and is the most often quoted is, is Arthur Young, who was um, an agriculturalist. The thing that I like about him is that he was this expert, um, but when he went to farm practically, which he did on a few occasions himself, he failed. And I think there's something wonderfully, something comforting about this, that he was this great expert, but actually couldn't put it into practice himself. But a lot of his book is kind of tedious because he's, he's fascinated with turnip yields and agricultural rotations and so on. So it's, it's um, and so, I, I, because it, it is Arthur Young, I wanted to pick, um, because of all the accounts, he, he is the single one that's most famous of all the hundred and so on. And he has a lot to say about Tipperary County, which is, is good news. I mean, you know, he could easily have gone to Ireland and not touch on the county. Um, so, I, I, I could have picked some Arthur Young on, on kind of, you know, turnip crops or something. Um, but instead, I, I decided he's much more interesting on the kind of sweaty interaction between Hurley and sex in North Tipperary. Um, so this is, is Arthur Young on hurling and sex in North Tipperary. So make it as you will. I should point out to you that I was discussing this with Danny Grace, who's from North Tipperary, and he said, probably quite rightly, that I think they probably saw him coming and were spinning him a yarn. Um, because the interesting contrast between him and the earlier John Loveday, who was the guy who saw the wake in Golden, Loveday is there describing what he actually witnessed. Here, Young is telling you what he heard, and there's a huge difference. But anyway, it's still entertaining. There is a very ancient custom here for a number of country neighbours among the poor people to fix upon some young woman that ought, as they think, to be married. 
They also agree upon a young fellow as a proper husband for her. This determined, they send to the fair one's cabin to inform her that on the Sunday following she is to be horsed, that is, carried on men's backs. She must then provide whiskey and cider for a treat, as all will pay her a visit after mass for a hurling match. As soon as she is horsed, the hurling begins, <coughs> in which the young fellow appointed for her husband has the eyes of all the company fixed on him. If he comes off conqueror, he is certainly married to the girl, but if another is victorious, he as certainly loses her, for she is the prize of the victor. These trials are not always finished in one Sunday. They take sometimes two or three. And the common expression when they are over is, such a girl was gold. Sometimes one barony hurls against another, but a marriageable girl is always the prize. Hurling is a sort of cricket. But instead of throwing the ball in order to knock down a wicket, the aim is to pass it through a bent stick, the end stuck in the ground. In these matches, they perform such feats of activity as ought to evidence the food they live on to be far from deficient in nourishment. <laughs> so, um, so, one way of, of, of winning matches, maybe. As I say, maybe they, they, they saw you coming and decided to. Because um, yeah. if, if you were to take any of that seriously, obviously you'd need some, some other information from other sources in relation to it, which I have not come across, so I don't know. Um, that account is from the 1770s, and at the same time as he was here in the 1770s, um, there's a chap called Thomas Campbell who was here who wrote a great deal. It's one of these accounts that is, has masses of material about Tipperary. Um, he's, he, he didn't just pass through, but he, he was visiting people and stayed here quite a, quite a while. Um, um, he's very much a, a figure from, from the Enlightenment in that he, he, he interested in more practical things, but he, he has an attitude and he is kind of judgmental. This is, is Campbell um, on the housing of the poor. Um, and th this is before it got awfully bad, before the famine, because you know the, the real population exploding hadn't yet happened because it's the 1770s. Um, this is written when he's staying in Tipperary Town, so it's probably a reflection of, of around that area. So this is on, on the housing of the poor. The manner in which the poor of this country live, I cannot help calling beastly. For upon the same floor, frequently without any partition, are lodged the husband and wife, the multitudinous brood of children, all huddled together upon straw or rushes, with the cow, the calf, the pig, and the horse, if they are rich enough to have one. Their houses are of several sorts, but the most common is the sod wall, as they call it. By sods, you are to understand the grassy surface of the earth. Some build their houses of mud, as we do, Others use stone without mortar for two or three feet from the ground and sod or mud for two or three on top of that, their side walls being seldom above five or six feet high. Sometimes you may see an ingenious builder avail himself of the side of a ditch, which serves for a side wall, and parallel thereto, he rears a wall in one or other of the modes I have described, as his own fancy, the facility of the method, or abundance of materials may lead him. Another will improve upon this plan and make the grip or foss of the ditch serve for the area of its habitation. Right, thanks. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about people like Campbell who, who came here, I mean, he already had his mind made up about various things. And that's one, one of the factors you find about visitors just before and after the Act of Union. Um, some of them were expecting that maybe the Act of Union might change things and there would be a better relationship between the two islands, but um, I think you know, um, they were very quickly disabused of, of that. Um, a name that's reasonably well known is a chap called Cold Hoare. So Richard Cold Hoare came here in 1806. Um, perfectly obvious um, where he's coming from. I mean, this is just one sentence from, from his written, and I could you know, make a game and say, who's he talking about? With unexampled fortitude and perseverance, he awed the turbulent and strengthened the loyal until the embers of dissatisfaction were completely extinguished. So he obviously regards this chap as heroic. He's talking about Sir Thomas Judkin Fitzgerald, who of course did appalling things in this county in 1798, so there's no doubt where, um, where Cold War is coming from. So we're, we've moved on and we're dealing with somebody who has a very different attitude from some of the people earlier in the 18th century. Um, another traveller was here in 1813, an anonymous traveller, um, which I wouldn't have expected. 
Um, he talks about the huge volume of cider made around Care. Now, he, he's talking about a really huge volume. A hogshead of 63 gallons of the stuff is consumed every week in some families throughout the year. That seems, I don't know whether you figure, it does seem an awful lot. And he describes the hedges for mines around Care planted with apple trees. And of course it would have been beautiful, but at the same time the, the amount of poverty would have been quite extraordinary. Um, the next reading is, is our first uh, lady. In 1827, um, a woman came into the county with the army, the British army obviously, um, following her, <coughs> her husband. Um, she, she, she wrote an account, she starts by, they were initially stationed in Ennis, and then the regiment were moved, and so they ended up in Cashel. And she just begins the account on a clear frosty morning in March 1827, the woman called Emily Fitzmaurice and her husband, and the regiment moved from Ennis to Cashel. The men assembled, this is an Ennis still, in marching order in the barrack square. The baggage, which always comprises women and children, moved off first. I like the idea of the baggage being women and children. And she passed through Thomastown, again a beautiful village, and this is her account of arriving in Cashel. Our first arrival in Cashel was not the most promising. The people at the inn who were expecting to fill their house from the approaching Kilkenny Assizes did not like to have their rooms occupied by officers billeted upon them. And I confess the tone in which this claim was asserted by some was not conciliatory. After a good deal of demanding and threatening on the part of the gentlemen, and vociferation on that of the landlady, tall, lean woman, we at last obtained rooms. The single officers took the rest. We had a salle de manger in common. A bit of very hard salt beef and a pudding was all the dinner that could be procured for those who were in good humour enough to eat it, while the others amused themselves by attacking the unfortunate waiter every time he came into the room. After a couple of days spent in this manner, our companions moved into the barracks, which were ready for their reception. And on it goes. Again, she has quite an interesting account of being in Cashel, and it's, um, I don't imagine too many wives of British um, soldiers wrote accounts of moving around. And it was, again, good luck for people interested in Tipperary history that just so happened she was in Tipperary, and she was also in the north of the county, county briefly. Um, her view, uh, as she looks at it, is, is again, she's not coming with an awful lot of preconceptions and she's, um, you know, she's ready to, to like people if, if, you know, taking them on face values. Um, some of the others who came, there's another chap who came around that time, um, Baptist Noel, um, well named, um, very kind of religious sounding name, and he was a, a reverend gentleman. Um, and this is his description of Clock Jordan. As I said, there aren't too many um, accounts of the touch on the north of the county. Um, but this is his description. This is from 1836. And it's, it's starts in Clock Jordan. Our road lay through Clock Jordan, which we found thronged with persons who had come to the monthly fair. Horses, cows, sheep, and pigs had been brought in for sale. The stalls were scantily supplied with apples, gingerbread, tinware, wooden vessels, bread, potatoes, etc., and all seemed busy with their negotiations. The women were in cotton gowns, and most of them wore caps. Of the men, some looked intelligent and lively, some were large and well-formed, others looked worn and thin, and many had a more coarse and degraded look than I had observed in any other town through which we passed. <coughs> Numbers were still coming into the town along the Limerick Road, some of whom were conducting their pig to market, with a wisp of straw tied to the hind leg. Others carried nothing but a shillelagh. Throughout the road we observed the usual crops of potatoes and corn, interspersed with bog, ill-drained grasslands, and occasionally a patch of flax. Nothing relieved the dull uniformity of the flat, but the same hilly horizon which was visible from Cangort. After Nina, poor looking place with a miserable suburb. The neighbourhood of the Keeper Mountains on the left made the scenery less tame. But still everywhere we saw a bare region, neglected fences, slovenly cultivation, decayed hovels, and half-naked men and women. Right, it's 1836 when he writes that, and reading his, his account of being in the county, I mean, he's still very much 
hanging on to the idea that um, if, if only various things happened, that the two islands would kind of kiss and make up. Um, if only the priests and people had not been. Just taking a slightly interesting point of view in that he, he, he can blame the British for, for mistakes in the past. If, if only they hadn't, um, the Protestant descendancy hadn't been, as he says, unprincipled and haughty. And if only the Union had been kind of worked properly, that everything now might be. But it's 1836, and I think he's, it's quite clear that um, if, if, if the Union 36 years earlier was a marriage, well, I think he's quite clear that divorce is, is, is likely to be around the corner. Um, the next is two, two ladies, um, and we're coming closer to the family, of course. And this is the 1840s, and this is uh, Lady Chatterton. Um, She's quite extraordinary um, in that she's, it's the 1840s, so everywhere she, see, she looks, she's going to find misery, but she's determined not to see any misery. So, I mean, if you know the, the story of Pollyanna, I mean, you know, who was determined to find good in everything, well, this, this particular lady rather annoys one because she's totally Pollyanna-ish. Anyway, she's in Cashel, and um, this is her, so, no, she's not, she's in Clamel. Yes, she's in Clamel. And this is her description of arriving in Clownell and having to put up with um, a, a dreadful hotel and just making the best of things. We left Woodstock yesterday and arrived at Clownell at 3 o'clock after a very stormy and disagreeable journey. We were rather dismayed at the miserable appearance of the inn where we had to pass the night and the remaining hours of the cold, windy day. The entrance, passage, and part of the staircase were covered with wet, dirty straw. The sitting room smelled strongly of smoking and whiskey, and the bedroom of damp and want of air. However, with a determination to be pleased, the annoyance of these sort of discomforts soon wears off, and we can always find something to excite our interest. On going down the dirty staircase, I discovered in the deep recess of the old window some fine geraniums and other flowers, always a charming sight. Then, as the interior of the sitting room was not very attractive, I looked out the window, and a pleasing object arrested my attention. A pretty woman in an opposite house, caressing a lovely child, with all the buoyant joy of a young mother's affection. To a mind in a healthy state, there is something very catching in happiness. So that though suffering ourselves, we often feel happy at the sight of happiness in others. Towards the evening, the weather cleared up, and we were glad to emerge from our dingy apartment into the pure air. We had an agreeable walk by the riverside, and saw a group of women washing and beating linen in the full glee of their lively national temperament. Their dress showed that they were amongst the poorest of the poor, one very pretty girl had the tattered remnants of an old brown stuff gown and scanty strips of a bright crimson petticoat hanging about her in picturesque disorder. Beneath the flimsy drapery appeared her well-formed bare legs, against which the stream was rippling. Her costume realized the expressive Irish definition of ragged attire. I have often heard Please, Your Honour, I've hardly attacked to call me good or bad, and as for Mary, she's blind. Our picturesque washing girl, despite her tatters, had her hair carefully arranged. It was gathered up behind her small head in the classical knot of a Grecian statue. Her animated countenance sparkled with fun, and her lively sallies excited shouts of laughter from the merry group. Here was another sight to make us happy and to raise our spirits. <laughs> Teeth are on edge at this stage, and on and on it goes. And the point about those ladies, the, those girls that she's describing beside the shore, the odds are within a few years they're dead, casualties of famine, but I mean, there's no sense, as she describes them as the poorest of the poor, they were the kind of people that were likely to be affected. But here is, I mean, she's determined in her visit in Ireland that she's going to see the picturesque and even if it's awful, she's going to find some good in it. And, and, and an acute contrast with, with, with her is Asenath Nicholson, who came again just before the famine. And her more famous account is the one she wrote during the famine, but she didn't come to the prairie during that time. Um, she was this extraordinary American woman, nothing to do with, with Ireland. Um, in New England, obviously, she would have come in contact with, 
um, people who emigrated from, from Ireland. Um, she was teetotal and vegetarian, obviously a little mad, um, but a thoroughly good woman, I mean, absolute do-gooder. I mean, she came here, um, she explains it herself I mean, in her book. Um, I came to gather no legends of fairies or banshees, but to read to the poor peasants the story of Calvary. So she was going to come and appreciate that, I don't know, but I think she was going to come and say to the spite of themselves. Um, the, the, the piece I, I picked from her, again, it's more for its entertainment value. She's travelling on her own, she's leaving Turles, she's being told about Mount Mary, which struck her as quite extraordinary, so she's on her way to have a look at it for herself. Passing through Cashel, she didn't have time to visit the rock, so obviously she just thought in the distance. And then this is her description from... from, from. <coughs> Cashel looked more deserted this day than usual, as a rich brewer in the city, a brother of Father Matthew, had died, and the shops were closed. You got that? In honor brother of Father Matthew, rich <laughs> brewer. <laughs> <laughs> when travelling by coaches and cars, I had been so much annoyed by the disgusting effluvia of tobacco that I dreaded the next stage, the changing of horses being the signal for a fresh lighting up. Seating myself upon the car at Cashel, my hat was to be stowed behind a rustic who had reloaded his pipe and began puffing till my unlucky head was enveloped in a dense fog, a favourable wind wafting it in that direction. Knowing that the consumers of this commodity are not fastidiously civil, I forbore to complain until I became sick. At length, I ventured to say, kind sir, would you do me the favour to turn your face a little? Your tobacco has made me sick. Instantly, he took the filthy machine from his mouth and archly looking at me, maybe your ladyship would take a blast or two at the pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Resumed his coughing without changing his position. I was cured of asking favours. Passing on from Cashel, a Roman Catholic priest seated himself upon the car, whom I found polite and intelligent. His first inquiries were concerning American slavery. Its principles and practices he abhorred, and he could not comprehend its existence in a Republican government. I blush for my country when on every car and at every party and lodging house, this everlasting blot on America's boasted history is presented to my eyes. Okay, well, one of the things that she's quite interested, interesting about, and she found it fascinating, was how much the people she met, the very ordinary people, knew about America. I mean, obviously, there was, even at that stage, before Anna got underway, there were a lot of contacts with, with America, which one might have been expected. She was here in 44, 45, and the following year, 46, another woman came here, Theresa Cornwall's West, <coughs> and she was an English artist, so her perspective, she wasn't about to save anybody, so. Um, but um, just she touches on a few places in the county. She went to Nine my house, which she found disgustingly filthy. And she went out to Clanmel. She had lunch at the Globe Inn, excellent cold duck. She loved the Knock Me Downs. Arfinan was a poor village. She found excessively picturesque. And on to Clahine, a very wretched town, where beggars swarmed, blind, caught and maimed, infant and old, all thrust their miseries into the foreground. Together, the natives were a brawling, wild, ferocious looking set of beings. And then she wrote, after all that, I was glad to leave behind the property and the sharp facedness of Tipperary and enter County Cork. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, I suppose, the, the most famous person who came during this period, 1825, is Walter Scott. And um, again, the rock obviously brought in that there was an account of, of he nearly being killed on the rock, clambering. Because at that stage, unlike now, where you can't get above ground level, you could go to any part of it, and he obviously found it. I mean, it played to this whole kind of romantic uh, side of things, so um, he's probably the most famous. Um, coming on to the famine, um, the most famous account is the, the one I mentioned at the beginning, Alexander Somerville, who was a self-educated Scottish um, radical. Um, he's one of these people who was sent to Ireland to write about what he saw for a newspaper. Um, these tend to be some of the more comprehensive and detailed accounts, but obviously they're coloured by politics of the newspaper that sends them and he's sent by a radical newspaper. So his big thing, of course, is the promotion of free trade, but he's here during the famine. And this is an extract um, 
is this is his fourth report, and it's dateline from Clamel. It's the 29th of um, January 1847. At that time, the military were busy guarding convoys of food, and Somerville describes this. So here's his description of food being conveyed under guard from Clamel <coughs> to Dungarvan. It's the height of the family. <coughs> I hired a car and attached myself to this expedition for Dungarvan. It was only going, however, to the halfway house, about 14 miles distant, on the top of the mountains. When an hour beyond the appointed time for the whole party to start had elapsed, and the soldiers had been standing in the rain, and in the deep mud half a mile beyond the town on the Dungarvan road, until they were soaked, the infantry threw their greatcoats, the cavalry threw their cloaks, or nearly so, 26 carts out of the 100, or thereabouts, which were to go to Dungarvan and reach the place of rendezvous. The carts were each drawn by one horse, and each driver had been at liberty to take any number of hundredweights of meal, according as he judged of the strength of his horse, up to 16. None were allowed to take more. Most of them had 1,200 weight or 1,400 weight. The payment for carriage to Dungarvan from Clamel, the distance being about 25 English miles and road bad, was one shilling per hundredweight. Most of the carts had come from places far distant from Clonmel. Any owner of a good horse can get employment for himself and horse in carrying meal. The poor horses and the poor men who own them have no chance, as none are sent out under the military escort but those supposed to be able to perform their work. When I saw the loaded carts assembled on the road and was told how bad the road was, so bad that Mr. Bianconi, the celebrated car proprietor, has ceased to run his public conveyances between Clamel and Dungarvan. It seemed to me impossible that such small horses could go over the mountains with such loads, <coughs> but I judged wrong of them. They went well and went through places where larger horses that I had known would have stuck fast. Five cars were obtained to carry the foot soldiers, the officer commanding, and the two armed constables. I had provided a conveyance for myself on the previous evening. It was, like the rest, an outside jaunting car. The seats hold each two persons when required, in which case the driver gets up in front. The drivers of the cars carrying the foot soldiers were all sitting aloft in front. Few travellers stir out here at present without being armed. The pay clerks of the public works are attacked and robbed frequently. Thanks. I mean, that was one of the features of, of the food being conveyed all over the county, and then see why they had to be guarded. And some of those account is particularly interesting because he's, he's coming out of the okay from a radical perspective. As you saw from that extract, um, he, he did spend, well, not his money, but I presume that he spent his money to hire a car and to go and see for himself. He's not actually depending on sitting in a, in a, in a, in a hotel in Clownmel, which sometimes news reporters are known to do, foreign correspondents, and wait for people to come and tell them that he does. So he, he is an interesting source. He mentions um, Bankney there. Um, another person who came to the county shortly after, again another newspaper reporter, a chap called Archibald Stark, has, has a wonderful little vignette about to bank me. It's, it's a personality it's, it, we set, have a certain idea about. Um, this is his description in, in Clanmel as he waited to board one of Bank and his coaches for Waterford, and he was surprised to see Bank and he himself loading bags into the long car. But he wasn't impressed by this because he decided. I thought, and God forgive me if I'm uncharitable, that in this volunteer movement there was a little of pride that apes humility. For there were half a dozen stout fellows belonging to the establishment, any one of whom could have taken care of my baggage. So he wasn't impressed by Bankany himself had to be seen to, but I presume Bankany thought it was a way of illustrating that he was still, you know, not carried away by his fame, which at the time was quite extraordinary. Um, moving into the later 19th century, the period after the famine. Um, again, I, I, to, to, from a lot of sources, I to pick things very much kind of at, at, at random. I mean, this is because this is this, this, we're in Thurles. Um, this is uh, an account of 1850, and of course the sin of Thurles. And uh, you go down. I don't know whether they're the same ones or not on the gates going into St Patrick's. A pair of large and beautiful eagles of cast metal and small size bell have just arrived, which were manufactured by Mr James Sheridan. Eagle Foundry, 163 Christ Church Street, Dublin. The eagles have been placed on the piers at the entrance gate and have a very handsome effect. So anybody who would be interested in the minutiae of um, street furniture in, in Thurles would be an interesting 
Um, the thing that made all the difference, of course, from the family period on, was the, the railways. Um, no longer were you depending on your carriage or even on my ankle. Um, William Irvine was travelling in the county in the late 1850s, and he has a wonderful story of going from Dublin to Killarney, and he had to he had a brief stop in Limit Junction. And at the time, obviously, he was stopped there because there was a hotel there long enough to have his dinner, which he described as excellent, and always provided at that famous station. However, when he returned to his carriage, he and his, the friends he was with found that all their bags and coats were being dumped on the platform. And the carriage occupied by, and this is his, his words, a parcel of military snobs. It's obviously some soldiers from the barracks that have taken it over. A class of fellows who are a positive and perpetual nuisance in Ireland. <laughs> so, again, it's an aspect of social history from the period that you kind of wouldn't necessarily be aware of. When they complained to a guard, they assumed that the guard had been bribed because the guard claimed that the fact that wasn't their carriage and that their carriage had been taken off the train. And by now the train was ready to leave, so they had nothing to do but gather all their bits and pieces and scramble onto the train as best they could. But obviously, um, Mr. Irvine wasn't <laughs> most pleased. Um, 1870, which is the next reading, uh, I mentioned some of these people came as special correspondents. 1870 was the um, Land Act, first the Gladstone Land Act. Um, so the whole land issue was in the air and being discussed and debated and so on. So the Times newspaper sent William O'Connor Morris, who was, um, the name sounds Catholic, but he was actually um, the Church of Ireland and later became the judge. Um, he worked for the Times newspaper. He came as their special correspondent. Travelled all over the county. Um, and this is his, this is again because I wanted to pick a few bits and pieces from North Tipperary. This is um, what he sent in from North Tipperary. And he's talking about the Stafford O'Brien State, State, which is near, I know there's Stafford O'Brien land in South Tipperary, but this is the Stafford O'Brien State, which is in, in, in well, near Nina, I suppose. This is 1870. Close to this town is the fine estate of Mr. Stafford O'Brien, well known as one of the most popular Tipperary landlords, and though unfortunately usually an absentee, liked by the people and generally respected. His agent, too, bears a high character, and I do not doubt has never entertained the thought of doing any intentional wrong to attend. I walked over the lands, was pleased with them, and entered casually into conversation with a good dame of one of the most substantial occupiers. There was an excellent slated house on the farm that probably cost £150, and this and the adjoining offices had been built, she informed me, out of her marriage portion. The rent was, and always had been, at a fair value. Her husband was merely a tenant at will, yet he had never received a penny of compensation or any equivalent that I could discover, and he had neither a lease nor a prospect of one. I asked why he had been so unwise as to lay out his money on another man's land without a particle of real security. She replied, pointing to a ruined cabin, that was all the accommodation when I came here, and a decent couple could not live in it. I then asked why he had not applied for a lease, and with what tenure he would be satisfied, regarding had to his outlay. She answered that Mr. Stafford O'Brien preferred his people to trust in his word that they did not like to trouble his honour, that perhaps his agent and he would not be pleased, that the land would possibly be revalued if an application for a lease were made, and of course that a mere 21 years lease would, in such circumstances, be of no advantage. Things might as well remain as they were, trusting to a gentleman who was good to the tenant and kept faith, unless they could get a term of 50 or 60 years. That would be of real use to it was said that's 1870, and it's worth remembering there that it's only 30 years before ownership of, of land by farmers becomes an issue. In 1870, it's not at all an issue. The only issue that's of any consequence is security of possession, not ownership. That comes much, much later. Um, you can also be interested in, in that, which I assume um, O'Connor Morris is reporting fairly accurately, um, is the sense of kind of deference um, to um, Stafford O'Brien. Uh, if you were looking at his reputation as a landlord, obviously, you'd have to take account of the sources rather than just depending on, on, on that one. Um, of the sources that I've, I've kind of used to illustrate, uh, the next one uh, is, is it may be the most unusual um, in that it's, it's from Australia. Um, there's nothing at all surprising with somebody returning to Ireland today whose ancestors came from Ireland 
now, you know, second, third, fourth generation in Australia, and they come back to discover. Um, you may have had the experience of they knocking at your door, maybe in kinship. And um, that's one of the things the internet has done. Um, what's unusual about this is that it's 1890, and this Australian chap shows up. Um, which means that um, his people had gone out much earlier in the century. He doesn't say, he, he actually leaves Australia in 1890 and goes around the world, so he obviously is doing very well for himself in Australia. He, he goes around the world, his big tour goes back home, probably never leaves Australia again, because he knows this is such an extraordinary um, um, occurrence, uh, once in a lifetime happening, he, he, he keeps an account and then has it privately published. So it's not a, again, it's a, a different kind of way of making material available. This would have been a very limited circulation just among his family, but it was a published account. And what's interesting is when, when he's in Tipperary, um, these people are, sal are in, in Salad. So there's just there's an interesting um, account of the going out to a mass um, in Salad. And he's quite an astute character, which is what makes the diary so interesting, in that while he's meeting all these people who are related to him, um, but he can kind of see through their desperate attempts to be and behave what they think is appropriately a middle class. It's the kind of Jones thing. And he, it's just interesting how he, how he picks up on that. He's inside. We went then in English's sidecar, the church at Salahed, to a mission, and I saw the best side since I left home. The whole place was packed. We, being favoured persons, got into the sanctuary and heard a common temperance lecture. The show outside the church was very good. The roadway was narrow and it was stuffed as full as it could be with ass carts and side cars and people so as one couldn't pass. Then there were droves of women selling all sorts of eatables, and inside the gates there were four tents selling all sorts of holy things. In fact, it looked like a picnic party. There were a great show of people there, and a lot of them seemed fairly off for Ireland, and were dressed well. The people are not at all agreeable, as they are not independent enough, and are afraid that their place is not what one was in the habit of seeing. So they go to a great lot of trouble to make one uncomfortable in their attempts to be kind. I won't live among them very long, as I'm off to Mitchell's town tomorrow. So I just, I just... Obviously, what he's to say about being in Tipperary is interesting anyway, but it's just that his comment on meeting these people and the way they reacted to this chap who's here from, from Australia, which in 1890 would have been very extraordinary. Um, his whole account, not just the Irish bit, but his, his take on going through the United States, and because he goes right around the world before he goes home, is, is, is quite, quite fascinating. Um, the attitudes that he's bringing with him, because he's, he's not... Australian as such, and he's not Irish as such, he's kind of an odd mixture, and he'd never been in Ireland before, so he comes with all kinds of expectations. And moving into the, the, the 20th century, um, um, there are a whole space of people writing, because the, the whole kind of home rule crisis, which went on and on and on and on and on, and there are a lot of books published during that period uh, addressing issues between um, the two islands. Um, some of them have made, you know, the neighbour next door, um, the one I'm going to use here, is because it has a temporary connection, is Bart Kennedy's um, The Green Sphinx. Um, Sphinx being obviously something that's unknowable, so again, it's the British attitude towards Ireland. Kennedy, um, an English travel writer and traveller and so on, but he did have temporary connections. Um, in the book he mentions his father was born in Paris. Um, in this extract he describes policing in Ireland, and he's actually basing it in what he saw in Kilsheila. And the, not just in the extract, but right through this book, um, he has obviously an obsession about the degree of policing. And he, he doesn't quote it, but he obviously echoes Tim Healy had a famous crack that um, the RIC was an army of no occupation. That's the thing. Anyway. Um, so this, this is his view of the, of the RIC in Kilsheila. And this is, is written in 1905, so it's right at the beginning of the century. Okay. The next day I found myself at Kilsheila a little village eight Irish miles to the west of Carrick and Shore. I had set out at something before ten that morning. My intention was to make Feathered, a place eighteen or nineteen Irish miles from Carrick. I had still ten or eleven miles to go, but I thought I would rest for a bit. An Irish mile is a quantity fearsome, mysterious and unknown. <laughs> it is longer by far than an English mile. 
and the politeness of the people makes it, at least for you, longer still. For when you ask a man on the road how far off the distant place for which you are making it lies, he tries to tell you in English miles. And the end is that you become fogged altogether. No man in Ireland can reckon distances in English miles. At least I did not find one. The people at a post office told me a legend to the effect that there were 2,240 yards in an Irish mile. But I fear that I do not accept the rosy statement of the post office geographer. In my private opinion, the Irish mile is a variable, far-stretching distance problem, which is past the power of solving. It was in Kilsheelan that the problem of the so-called Irish police was forced upon my notice. Kilsheelan is a little village in Tipperary. It is said to be four Irish miles from Clonmel, a place with only 200 people living in it. As I walked into it, I noticed three tall, well-set-up men lounging together in its one short street. They were dressed in dark green, and they had the unmistakable air of soldiers who were off duty. One of them was leaning against the wall with his hands in his pockets. He was listening easily to a discussion that was going on between his comrades. These were the world-famous Royal Irish Constabulary. They were on duty. I went into the public house at the corner of the road leading to Feather. Here I saw another tall, fine, soldierly-looking man dressed in dark blue. He was leaning against the bar, looking very bored. He also belonged to the world-famous Royal Irish Constabulary. He was on duty. <laughs> I wanted to get a cigar and a cup of coffee, but the woman behind the bar informed me that they had no coffee in the house. And then the tall, soldierly-looking young policeman straightened himself up beside the bar and volunteered the information that I could get coffee at the public house a little further down the road. I thanked him and went out. I found that there were five policemen in Kilsheelan, a place of 200 people, and the patrol work outside the village was nothing to speak of. I am not going into the problem of policing of Ireland just here, but I will say this. I have been in some of the hardest frontier towns in the world, places where every man went armed and where killing was in the air. And in a place as big as this Kilsheelan one, one in a place as big as this Kilsheelan, one policeman would easily have done the work that these five policemen were doing here in Ireland. Granting, for the sake of argument, that the Irish were the biggest thugs and thieves and murderers and arson fiends uncaught when shot from the home, the five policemen were still too large in order. One of them was ample for the work. <laughs> <laughs> and on it goes. Um, Things to bear in mind. But when using that as a source, if you were to use it, is that, that I mean, apart from his travel writing, he also wrote novels, and that if, if these people also wrote novels, it very much impinges on how they're going to write what they see, because they're going to come at it very much kind of from a novelist's perspective. Um, and my last reading is from another fiction writer, um, Sean Quaylon, who was um, in the area in the 19, late 1930s. And again, because we're in Thurles, and he has quite an interesting description about events and people and places in Thurles. So that's maybe why I, I, I picked that. So this is Sean O'Fale on Thurles, the 1930s. Our last reading. I was so astonished at the transformation that has come over this town in the last 15 years. I started to wander around on my own. This must now be one of the most prosperous towns in Ireland. As with Navan, Athlone, and Carlow, it is the cleanest. Its prosperity is in a small degree due to the new sugar beet factory which has been opened there, but in the main to the fact that it has always been a sound farmer's town, a market and banking centre, a place where there are good fairs. As always, it is the fields that make Ireland. In Clonmel, which is South Tipperary, they say the North Tipperary people are all mad and have criminal tendencies. <laughs> My stout librarian girl said it was due to inbreeding, but I would not mind her. <laughs> she actually told me that Thurles is in south of Tipperary. It is certainly a fact that North Tipperary is, from the point of view of the guards, a hotspot. Thurles is central Tipperary. North Tipperary is up in the hills. The devil's bit to keep her hills, she failed across the Shannon. There have been a couple of good murders there in recent years, and I wish I could tell without fear of libel the true story of one of them. 
Perhaps there has always been a tradition of wildness up there. The old Irish song about the rapparee, Eamon and Knick, Ned of the Hills, is set up there. After the siege of Limerick, which ended the Williamite Wars in the year of the Boyne Water, 1690, and ended the old Gaelic Ireland forever and ever with them, it may be that the dispossessed and beaten Irish took to these remote places and started a tradition of outlawry. At any rate, my father, who was in the old Royal Irish Constabulary and was stationed out of Limerick for a time, used to always say that the police believes that a border of two counties is a troublesome place. Wild or not, these thoroughless people have much more edge to them than the easy-going town Belfield. Their town shows it. The great wide square, concrete from pavement to pavement, the bright shops, every one of them well-dressed, the busy air of the streets even on an ordinary afternoon, and the almost total absence of antiquities marks this out as a modern business town with no nonsense about it. And it has gone on improving every year. Old residents tell me that their fathers have handed them a very different picture of an older thermos, when, as one of them said to me, you could step from dung heap to dung heap to the square. Hobbles surrounded the centre of the town. The elder Dr. Callanan, the father of the present dispensary doctor, told me he once handled 175 cases of fever in a single epidemic, and he has handled typhus as well as typhoid. Older traditions can revive the famine days when people died in the fields by the ditches, their mouths green from eating nettles, even as Spencer records from an earlier period. While in those unions which Dan O'Connell opposed so inexplicably, the dying were laid in rows upon rows upon the floor. An old man I met on the bridge told me he recalled a time when the town might have been thought of as composed of six shopkeepers who made pots of money out of the big houses all about and there were so many gumbean men, or tight-fisted, hard-screwing middlemen to the farmers. But, as he said, they are gone now with the froth of the river. The river, by the way, is still the shore. It rises not much more than a mile away from the Nor of the Devil's Pit. They're gone with the big houses on which they relied. And he waved his hand over the river, past the old 12th century castle, the town's only relic, down towards Feather and up the river towards Temple Moor. Archer's Town House, Lane's Park House, Killeen House, Ballysheehan, New Park, Moburnan, Coolmore, Derry Luskin, Brownstown House, Ballylonan, Lloydsborough, Inch. How many of them are left now? Ah, it is a pity, for they were fine houses and gave good employment. <coughs> but surely the beet factory, I protested, must employ as many as the whole lot of them put together. Tisn't alike, he insisted morosely. Tisn't alike. What's a factory? Here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> what am I to a factory? No more than that stone. It's almost like a dialogue from Beckett, isn't it? You can imagine him sitting on the bridge out there and being interrogated by Quaylon, whatever he would made of Quaylon's fancy metropolitan ways. But it's very, um, we'll say, a lot of interesting sources from, from Thurlis that I would like to think were being used. Um, in Thurlis schools. But, um, that's the last reading, but just to, to finish, um, this is another brief quotation because I keep finding um, business of gathering together um, these travellers' accounts um, is ongoing, obviously. From now on, each one that I can, can come across becomes more and more difficult to find because I think I've pretty much located all the obvious ones. Um, this is, is, is the one I came across actually just two weeks ago about reading and having nothing to do with this. And, uh, it's always fun from somebody from Tipperary to get a kick into Clan Mel. Um, one of the reasons why I've included this. This is a letter from Elizabeth Bowen. And um, she's, she's writing to her um, lover, who was a Canadian diplomat. And he was back in Canada. And it's September 1945. And I mean, apart from stuff that's going on between them, um, there's wonderful social history from the 1945 period. And she's just telling him what's been going on in Bowen's court. Um, the weekend passed, I'm bound to say, in a haze of drink. With a few tottering walks through the dripping woods and a Sunday afternoon visit to Anne's room. And then she's talking to her guests, had to make the most awful cross country bus journey from County Kilkenny to get here, Bowen's Court and Call. A three hour wait, for instance, in Clonmel, which, apart from being Sterling's birthplace and a genial, fly blown small town, is of little interest. 
no ring, that's her first cousin from one of her guests. This is the bit I like. Bought up half the Clamel Woolworths and arrived here with us in paper bags. So it's a the big house. And this lady finally, I mean, very kind of Anglo, and she has her bags of toffees and gobstoppers from Woolworths. It is thought that private cars may be allowed on the roads again by Christmas. And again, interesting socially, that would be very nice, and so on it goes. And there are some other references. Um, one of the things I haven't used, because as I say, uh, having put this together, I decided not to do it topically. You know, pick land or you know, violence or politics or something. Um, is, is using fiction. And I just wanted to, to finish by giving you a, a, a brief kind of idea of how fiction might be used as an interesting source. Um, not for what happened, because obviously if it's fiction, it's made up, but um, with regard to attitudes of mind, um, it can be very telling. Um, and this kind of material hasn't been used very much. I've been trying to use it recently myself in relation to something I've been writing. Um, this is a, a novel called O'Reilly of the Glen. The Glen in question is the Glen of Ireland. And um, the writer is particularly interesting because she's um, a Mrs. Chastel de Boinville. Wonderful sounding name, but her husband was the rector in Tipperary Parish Church of Ireland. Um, he had obviously a French, probably Huguenot background. She was Irish, Anglo Irish. Um, she was some of herself from, from Cork. Um, but she wrote various novels, and they're not high literature. I mean, I suppose they're today what might pass as chick lit. <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating because she, the book is published in 1918. And she's in Tipperary during that period. They're, they're in, not in Tipperary very long, um, but they're in that period where there's a lot of activity in, in Tipperary town with the volunteers and Tracy and all that stuff is going on. And she's the local rector's wife, so obviously she's not blind to what's going on, but she has a particular attitude. The story in the novel is kind of what you'd expect. It's um, her, her, her heroine um, arrives in Tipperary from Dublin, um, she's engaged to a British Army officer, and various circumstances bring her to Tipperary. And um, she meets this chap who's Pierce O'Reilly, and he's kind of the local landowner in the Glen, but he's from this Irish Catholic family. And he's very much involved um, in the volunteers, and in Sinn Féin. Now, because he's kind of the love interest, he has to be redeemable. So the villain of the piece is the guy who's managing his estates. And again, it's an interesting twist because quite often looked at from um, an Irish nationalist perspective, the estate agent is often seen as the, as the villain. She's looking at the story from a unionist, Protestant perspective, and the villain of the piece is still the estate agent, who's the kind of the local guy who's directing. Well, she doesn't really distinguish between IRB, the volunteers, and Sinn Féin. She kind of mixes them together. Um, I just want to read a little extract. This is a discussion. Um, between the heroine and the hero. And obviously they're kind of falling for each other, but politics is getting in the way. There was a circular rustic seat around the trunk of an old oak tree. O'Reilly placed a hand lightly on Rosamond's arm and drew her towards it. They sat down. He began to talk again. I don't want to annoy or wound you in any way. Please believe that. But may I point out a few of the reasons for our attitude in Ireland today? Do. I really would like to understand things a little. It all seems so contradictory somehow. You know our ideals, liberty for Ireland, independence and freedom. We have worked for them for centuries in vain. You know how we came to be under English rule and how a certain number of Irish people have struggled from one generation to another for what we call a cause. A few hot-headed, violent partisans have done harm in the past by letting themselves go. A few murders and outrages have been committed and these are remembered against the party. And no noble ambition or lofty aim is recognised. We are all supposed to be tarred with the same brush. Rosamond moved uneasily. He waited. But as she didn't speak, he continued. We are sneered at and called foolish, if not insane. Could be Patrick Pierce talking. We are condemned as criminals and laughed at for our youthfulness and our boyish zeal. Some people refuse to take us seriously. Others are against us. Outside our own circle, nobody has a sympathetic thought for us. Nobody has any toleration. Can you wonder at our Sinn Féin motto then? But have you any tolerance for those who do not agree with you? I'm afraid we have not. We have learned to meet hardness and bitterness in the self-same spirit. Will you blame us when our hopes have been blighted, our wishes scouted, our aspirations snubbed? 
and we are plagued with fooled, overruled by incompetent jesters. Even if we could forget or forgive the past, the lure of the past, have we any just cause to be thankful for the present? Ah, Rosalind, ours is a black list of crimes against England. Ever since 98, what has happened? It's been fantastic here. Let me tell you just a little. Those who strove for freedom were flogged, hanged, and burned. In 48, our people were starved, starved, I tell you, so that England's larder should be full. The survivors after the famine were sent across the Atlantic in coffin ships, many of them to be thrown overboard. Are not the bones of our people wiping at the bottom of the ocean? Can you wonder that we cherish hatred? What happened not so long ago in Dublin, when the Scottish borderers had orders to spare neither women nor children but to clear them out of root and branch? And so on it goes. It's fascinating to think that those are the words being put into this chap's mouth by this wife of the Anglican rector in Tipperary. So it's a wonderful source to use, and with that I'll finish. Thank you very much.